All right, it looks like we're uh, just about ready to get started here. Uh, I would like to direct everybody's attention to the top of your screen where you will find controls to start the Q&A session. Uh, please go ahead and open that now and feel free to post any of your questions uh, there at any time during today's webinar. After the webinar, I'll, I'll be summarizing those questions and uh, send them out to all of the uh, registrants. I'll give a, give a few seconds for you guys to open that up. All right, I'll start off with a, a brief introduction about us. Jesus for Pros has been servicing the SUAS community for a little over seven years now and has become an industry leader in aerial thermal imaging solutions since the launch of our first Nike pot pit back in 2014, which was largely based off of the DJI Phantom 2 and FLIR's port thermal camera. Since then, we've continued to expand our thermal offerings to include advanced solutions like the Featured Zenmuse XT, as well as many other unique solutions that uh, meet critical business needs out there in the uh, commercial markets. DSL Pros is a full service repair and technical support shop based out of Southern California. We carry and stock a full line of uh, Zenmuse XT configuration, so whatever the need, we've got you covered. My name is Robert Scott, and I run the product development department here at DSLR Pros. I've been working on all things remote control or transmitted over radio frequencies for close to about 15 years now. From cars, planes, and now multi-rotors, I've seen just about everything there is out there to be seen. Now, this presentation is not meant to be formal training on thermography, but more of an orientation to the technology and how it applies to the rapidly growing uh, industry of aerial remote sensing. So what is infrared? In simple terms, think of infrared as visible light, which has a source and also can be reflected off of other objects. Officially, infrared, or IR for short, is electromagnetic radiation that has a longer wavelength than that of visible light, which makes it invisible to the naked eye. Infrared radiation carries radiant energy, or in other words, thermal radiation, which starts just after the red end of the visible light spectrum, right about 700 nanometers, uh, extending to about uh, one millimeter just before microwaves. In this graphic, you can see on the far left, uh, you've got gamma rays and x-rays, uh, and then the visible light spectrum, which is represented by the rainbow graphic. And just to the right of that far left of the red is where you will find infrared. And then moving on to microwave, radar, and radio. So in the next few slides, I'm going to address uh, some of the more common questions that we see about infrared. Uh, first off, uh, I would say one of the most common is whether or not it's x-ray. Um, as you saw in the previous graphic, the x-rays are far on the left. And in this case, in this image, uh, infrared is not x-ray, but um, it does have the ability to detect differences in radiant thermal energy down in structures where the heat transfer of certain materials is significantly higher than its surrounding area. This is known as thermal bridging. It can be observed in various forms. In this particular example, you can see where the studs have, have transferred their heat energy into the drywall, making it visible to the IR camera. Uh, this type of thermal inspection can be used to identify hot or cold spots related to insulation gaps or while performing a uh, building and envelope inspection. This next image, uh, you can see where the thermal radiation from a buried hot water line uh, is transferring radiant heat energy through the concrete foundation and also from behind the stucco wall. This type of inspection might be used to identify and map certain types of buried infrastructure. Now, this image was taken later in the evening where the temperature delta is much greater than if it were taken at midday. Additionally, if you're looking to map a uh, buried infrastructure where the temperature delta is not as extreme as in this example, flying at altitude might yield better results for greater contrast. Obviously, uh, flying at different times of the day would, would obviously uh, give you better contrast as well. So 
spectral range, uh, uncooled versus cooled. Uh, we, we do get this quite a bit where uh, folks are looking to detect um, gases via an uncooled core. The Zenus XT is based off of the FLIR TAL2 uncooled thermal camera, which has a spectral range of 7.5 to 13.5 micrometers and can only detect the gases that are under pressure with a large enough temperature differential. On the other hand, a cooled uh, gas finder series from FLIR will have a spectral range of about 3.2 to 3.4 micrometers and can detect, can detect unpressurized fugitive gases in the air. Uh, this particular image shows the, um, the gas drain from the pressurized LP gas as it leaves the container uh, in the forefront, while at the same time you can't see the gas flow coming from the natural gas burner on the stovetop. Uh, the reason why you can see sort of the heat signature is because it was turned on in order to uh, heat up the, uh, the burner so you can actually see it. Otherwise, uh, it, it's very difficult to see, uh, as you can see in the other three, just to its right. So just to recap on that, uh, if you're looking to detect uh, gases, it's, you're going to want to be able to see um, you would need to see the, the pressurized, uh, uh, the temperature differential from a pressurized gas flow. All right, emissivity and reflected energy. One of the more uh, important things to consider with thermal cameras is the reflected energy and emissivity. Uh, the graphic on this slide shows the best viewing angles being within the 60 degrees of center where the reflection and emissivity would be ideal for observation. Um, we definitely recommend if you're, if you're looking to do inspection that um, you, you obviously seek uh, official certification for thermography. Uh, that's where you're going to learn uh, all the specifics related to setting the proper emissivity. Um, emissivity is a measure of the efficiency in which uh, surfaces emit thermal energy. Various surface types will, re will radiate thermal energy at different ratios. And in order to get accurate temperature readings, you'll want to record certain weather conditions at the time of the measurement, um, as this can introduce errors if not properly uh, corrected for. Uh, obviously, you'd want to notate the surface type, uh, humidity, uh, ambient temperature, and even wind. Uh, different uh, surface types like glass uh, are noted to have a emissivity of 0 0.092. Uh, this image, you can see uh, the next slide, which uh, will actually illustrate the um, different emissivity levels. You can see in this example where the heat energy of the individual sitting inside the car uh, behind the glass window is not being received by the thermal sensor because far infrared thermal radiation can't pass through the glass. You can also see where the, uh, the, the actual individual holding the camera, which is probably about uh, zero degrees, is also reflected in the side of the car. And the, um, the background of the trees is reflected against the glass. In this image, you can see the dispersion of boiling hot water into a cold standing pool of water. And as you get further out in the viewing angle on the top right hand corner, uh, you'll be able to see the reflected heat energy of a nearby power line uh, visible on the surface of the water. So when you are out there uh, and, and gathering your data, that's definitely something that you want to be well aware of, uh, especially when you're flying, is your viewing angle, uh, what angle, and also obviously your, your emissivity. Uh, later on in the PowerPoint presentation, uh, I'll be going over um, sort of the post analysis and, and showing you where you can actually set those uh, settings. All right, performance versus radiometric. Uh, this is often a, a, a subject that um, lots of people are a little bit confused about. And what I'm showing you here are the post analysis data that you would capture after your flight. On the left hand side, performance or qualitative uh, thermal imaging requires the detection and visualization of temperature differences and distributions of an area of interest. Qualitative thermal imaging um, images are displayed as false color palettes to allow the operator to quickly spot an area of concern. However, they do not capture any specific temperature data. 
and you can see on the left hand side you're, you're essentially just looking at the, uh, the false color palettes but uh, in that image um, you're not going to have any uh, specific temperature data whereas on the right hand side the radial metric or quantitative image you can see that uh, there are a number of annotations on the actual image because they are it's been basically processed through uh, a software that you can then take your specific temperature measurements and I'll be showing you that a little bit later on in the uh, presentation. So a radiometric or quantitative thermal imaging requires acquisition of true temperature data per pixel that can then be processed and post through software. Um, a thermal camera enabled with advanced radiometry will always save the image in grayscale format um, with the 14-bit temperature data saved to each image. Once that radiometric image is imported into software, the operator is then able to manipulate the color palettes, uh, perform various temperature measurements uh, on any pixel of the screen uh, using the tools, as you can see. Now, this next comparison is going to show you the difference between a performance and a radiometric as you would see it in a live video stream. So this is as you're applying. Uh, on the left-hand side, you'll see the performance or qualitative, where even though you you know when you when you snap the image, you're not going to have temperature data. There is a way to uh, to enable what's called the spot meter, which puts a target right in the middle of the screen, and at that point you can get temperature readings. Now, uh, obviously, you'll have to maneuver the gimbal and the craft uh, to to Put that spot on your target to get that temperature reading and from there you would need to screen capture uh, that uh, that live video from your smart device in order to retain that uh, temperature reading on the right hand side you see the live video feed from a radiometric uh, enabled core where you will have spot meter but uh, the difference here is that you can point or tap anywhere on the screen and be able to get your temperature reading. So that's gonna allow, um, I'd say, an easier process to, uh, to get those temperature readings, uh, simply because you don't have to maneuver the gimbal or the craft onto an object. Uh, another benefit to that is that uh, you have what's called a um, high and low temperature indicator. So you can essentially create a, a box on your screen and uh, sort of maneuver that anywhere on your screen and within that region it's going to give you a high and low temperature alert automatically live as you're as you're flying and obviously uh, in post uh, you'll have the temperature data saved to each image where you can then further manipulate it this is an example of a performance picture uh, obviously qualitative like uh, like we talked about earlier where uh, the Performance is going to basically give you um, or give the operator a, a quick way to visualize temperature via color palette. In this image, you can clearly see the temperature of the, transports, the transformer is uh, pretty hot compared to the rest of the components on that utility pole. Some other uh, use cases uh, would be uh, flat roof inspection. This next image is um, sort of an example of radiometric uh, quantitative use case. Now, on the right, you can obviously see where there is a high temperature heat signature, uh, possibly a bad panel um, in this particular solar panel array. It's not a reflection from the sun, which again, in our earlier, uh, of course, you, the earlier uh, segment, we talked about emissivity and reflect, uh, reflected energy. Um, you can tell that on the left hand side, the color photo, that there is no sun glare there. So obviously with a performance board, you would have been able to, 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 to quickly identify that hotspot. Where the radiometric is uh, useful in a, in, a, in a solar panel inspection situation is if you're creating 2D and 3D mosaic maps. Um, there are specific softwares that uh, allow you to, to basically map those or stitch them together uh, with that uh, temperature data that's saved to those files. So the next one is, uh, this next slide is going to 
talk about your nine hertz versus 30 hertz. Um, the comparison here is mostly going to be, uh, I would say the difference in frame rate is most notable when tracking fast moving objects uh, and not so much during a stationary inspection scenario. Another consideration when choosing your frame rate uh, uh, is that thermal camera exports are regulated through the Bureau of Industry and Security, or BIS for short. For example, a 9 hertz thermal camera can be exported out of the United States, where a 30 hertz can't. There are other exceptions, obviously, to this, and it's highly recommended that you refer to the BIS for further export controls that may apply to your specific situation. At the end of the presentation, I'll include a couple of links and resources for that as well. Go ahead and play this for you. It's a video clip. You can see on the left hand side where uh, the frame rate um, is a little bit a little bit choppy because of the slow frame rate versus the 30 hertz on the right, which is a little bit more fluid. I'll play that a couple more times so everybody can see that. One thing to note too is that uh, the live video stream uh, on the left and the slow uh, was also a bit choppy. So uh, this is not only in post, but it's also what you're gonna see in the, in the live video stream. All right, resolution and lens configuration. Uh, I would say that this subject is probably um, one of the more complicated, and you know, there's there's definitely a lot of consideration to be uh, to be um, to be addressed here. And I definitely recommend that you talk to some of our uh, consultants to to kind of identify the best for the best uh, configuration setup for your use case. Uh, this particular slide shows a comparison between a 640 and a 336, which with match field of view. So in other words, the 640 on the left with a 19 millimeter lens has about has a 32, field, 32 degree field of view uh, when compared to a 336 9 millimeter at 35 uh, degree field of view. Both of these images taken from uh, 100 feet, uh, you can see the difference in resolution there. Um, so there's different things that you're going to want to consider if you're looking just to detect or identify, and we'll kind of talk about that later in terms of uh, pixels on target. This next slide is uh, sort of the opposite where we're talking about the same, um, same lens, different resolution. 640 on the left with a nine millimeter, 69 degree field of view at 100 feet versus a 336, nine millimeter, 35 degree field of view at 100 feet. So again, in different situations, uh, you might need the uh, the narrow field of view uh, because of uh, a standoff distance. So again, these are these are all considerations that um, we definitely want to talk about, and it's specific to your uh, for, for your specific use case. So ultimately, the resolution configuration you choose is is driven by your specific need to either detect or identify. Um, the more pixels you can put on target, uh, obviously, the more accurate your temperature readings will be if you're if you're doing some types of uh, inspection. Otherwise, if you're looking for sort of a search and rescue application, it's more about um, simply uh, detecting a, a heat signature at, at certain heights. So on the far right, you see a 640 resolution at about 30 meters or 100 feet. Uh, you've got about 320 pixels on target. Uh, so you're going to be able to detect small uh, objects like a bird uh, or a bird's nest. Uh, compared to the far left, which is a 160 resolution at the same height and distance, uh, you've only got about 20 pixels on target. So uh, your minimal detection is slightly larger, um, more of a, a, a large, uh, I would say a large game animal. This next uh, segment is, is going to go over the post analysis and this largely uh, addresses the uh, radiometric uh, images that you capture. As I stated earlier, when you take a radiometric image, uh, the, the image by default is going to be your white hot uh, type setup. 
uh, once you import that, uh, once you import that into the uh, software, the Clear Tool software, uh, you'll be able to see on the right-hand side where you can enter your emissivity, reflected temperature, uh, humidity, and all those uh, environmental variables. On your left, you have some tools where you can manipulate your color palette, and you're going to want to select the color palette that's obviously appropriate for what your uh, for your specific use case. You also have tools like the spot temperature reading. Uh, you can place that anywhere on the uh, image and uh, you'll see your temperature reading over there on the right hand side. And you can take multiple readings there. Another tool at your disposal is, uh, is the area measurement tool which gives you a uh, sort of a box like we saw earlier and it gives you the high, I'm sorry, min, max and average uh, within that specified area. Obviously, you can drag that around and it gets you that temperature reading on your right hand side. And to adjust your range or your temperature range, you simply grab the outside brackets and drag them. And you can see that uh, as I drag that, uh, it's lowering the, uh, the minimum temperature range there. And to adjust your span, simply grab the entire bar in the middle and drag that, and that's gonna, it's gonna adjust that for you. After you've uh, made all your annotations and, and, and saved all of your uh, your notes, the actual image is going to have those annotations uh, on the image. So you can you can actually send that image out to uh, other folks, and uh, you'll be able to see those uh, annotations there. I've got a question here. Give me one second. It looks like there was a, a question, uh, Justin. Thanks for that question. Um, is there an option to measure an area of a custom drawn polygon, or could this be added in a future software update? Uh, I know that FLIR uh, is obviously uh, doing a lot of um, modifications, and uh, that is possible. I'll, I'll definitely uh, follow up with them on that and uh, get back to you on that. All right, the next few slides, I'm just simply gonna go over a couple of um, suggested kits that we offer. Obviously, these are not end all. Um, we typically uh, will we'll take a custom case and um, you know understand what your requirements are and uh, make suggestions there. Um, mostly, I wanna go over the differences in compatibility from one platform to another. The Inspire One, as you see here, has a rough flight time of about 18 to 23 minutes uh, in a range of five kilometers, compatible with the Zimus XT, X3, and Z3, which is a zoom. Uh, it's got an optical zoom. Obviously, you have um, some night uh, LED for operations at night for search and rescue, and uh, a payload drop system for uh, search and rescue as well. This, this system setup is pretty good for roof inspection as well. Very simple kit and uh, easy to use. Uh, got some questions. Uh, uh, Tom, the photo is is actually stored uh, on your uh, camera on your SD card. And once you once you download those, you essentially are uploading that to your computer, and it's stored on your local uh, on your local computer. Uh, Rosa, the, the pillow drop system works on the Inspire by the mechanics of the landing gear, which raise and lower. Uh, so it's sort of a fixed claw that. Uh, when the landing gears are in a down position, are, are closed, and once you raise the landing gears, it is then disengaged. And that essentially allows you to uh, drop things like uh, 
uh, I'll say water or an emergency radio in a search and rescue type uh, situation. All right, uh, next platform, the Matrice 100. Uh, this is a pretty uh, pretty open platform. It has a couple of different, um, uh, I would say, uh, upgrades that you could do. Uh, flight time is between 25 and 30 minutes. Range is about five kilometers. Compatible with the Zenmuse XT, X3, C3 again, which is an optical zoom and the Z30, which is a 30 times optical zoom. Uh, you also have an option to add a 360 degree optical avoidance system. And uh, you can also do a, a, a dual battery type setup. So typically if you're uh, doing some agricultural work and you need to be able to fly very long stints, this might be the best uh, platform for you. Or even in um, uh, some of the larger mapping types uh, requirements for like solar panel inspection. Rosa had a question on the uh, spec on the stork for the Inspire. Um, I will get that for you and, and shoot that over. Again, all of these questions will be summarized uh, in post and I'll be able to send those out with, uh, with all the answers. Hey Joe, yes, I will be posting uh, the, the video link. However, however, uh, I will not be sending out the actual slides, but you will be able to uh, reference this video, uh, video link. Rosa, and uh, to answer your question on the uh, on the stork, uh, the payload is 800 grams. All right, moving on. Next platform, the Matrice series. Uh, this is the latest. Um, addition to the DJI platforms, uh, it comes in three models, the Matrice 200, 210, and uh, 210 with RTK. Uh, the flight time range is between 26 and 38 minutes, uh, obviously depending on the configuration. Uh, range is about seven kilometers, and compatibility is the Zemus XT, uh, Zemus X4S, X5S, and the Z30. Uh, this also has uh, a rating of IP43, and it also includes what's called AirSense. It's a it's a new um, uh, ADSB uh, receiver that allows you to see other uh, traffic uh, for safety, other uh, air, manned aircraft traffic. Great question, Tom. Uh, is there an adapter for the XT to use on the Inspire 2? Uh, currently, the Inspire 2 has largely been um, dedicated for commercial filming use. And I don't believe there are going to be any uh, integrations for the Zemus XT on the Inspire 2. However, uh, give us a call. Um, we have a, a number of solutions uh, that we could definitely talk about, but uh, give us a call. All right, next platform. Next platform we have is the uh, DJI Matrice 600. Flight time range in between 25 and 30 minutes. Range of about five kilometers. Uh, compatibility XT, uh, X3, Z3, and Z30. Also, um, uh, you've got an option to upgrade to the DRTK. This particular setup uh, has a lot of built-in redundancies. You can see that uh, the image on the right it's got six arms, six motors, it runs six batteries. Uh, that is basically built-in redundancy. Uh, should one or two motors fail or one or two batteries fail, you still are able to fly. Uh, it's also got three GPS modules and three IMUs for, uh, for a triple redundancy as well. Good for uh, flying around um, large metal infrastructure, uh, surveys, uh, power line inspection, especially if you add the, uh, the DRTK to that. Yes, Joe, hi. Uh, the M600, can it use the X5S? Currently, no. Uh, currently, DJI has not 
uh, enabled the X5S uh, on the M600. Um, whether or not they do, that's that's uh, that's still pending. Uh, I know that uh, they're they're kind of separating the product lines, but um, yeah, currently it is not compatible. All right, the next uh, platform is the Elios by Flyability, uh, which is the world's first collision tolerant flying inspection and exploration drone. Uh, basically designed to that uh, if you collide into something, um, you know, it's, it's not going to be damaged. It's got a, a very lightweight uh, carbon fiber uh, cage that runs around the entire unit. Um, it, it has both an HD optical and thermal sensor, measures just under 400, uh, 400 millimeters in diameter, and essentially is designed to operate in confined spaces and non-line of sight where man entry is not possible or, desi or desirable due to uh, hazardous conditions. One question here. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a number of ways uh, to have multiple screens um, with the DJI units. Uh, you've got um, you've got uh, HDMI outputs uh, on the remote controls, of which you can uh, you can essentially hook up external monitors to that. Or additionally, you can run a uh, a third uh, remote, uh, which some folks have done in order to uh, to to have that uh, additional uh, additional viewing screen. Some of the new uh, applications too with the Matrice 200 series is, uh, is, a, is a platform which will allow uh, allow an operator to view what's on that, uh, basically view from the, from the camera and gimbal uh, over an internet application. I'll be able to get some information to you guys on that as well in post. All right, I will uh, open it up to Q&A uh, if there are further questions. I've also posted some links down here. Obviously, uh, we want everybody to fly safe. Uh, posted a link for Know Before You Fly. Also, further, um, you can find further information for uh, from the FAA uh, and also uh, information on export uh, with the BIS. And if you're looking to get uh, certified for thermography, I've got a link for the infrared training center as well. Great question, uh, Sam. Uh, we do offer financing. Uh, we've got financing options for a lot of these uh, packages. We definitely recommend you giving us a call and uh, we, can, we can work through uh, your specific uh, use case and, and get you financing. Got it, Joe. Uh, Joe had a question about the 210 RTK versus the M600. Um, obviously, on both options, you can run RTK for both. Uh, so you'll get the centimeter uh, centimeter accuracy. Uh, the difference on the 210, uh, it is IP43 rated, whereas the M600 is not. Uh, on the M600 side, uh, you have some built-in redundancies uh, like the multiple motors, multiple batteries, uh, multiple IMUs, and that sort of thing. Obviously, there's also a payload capacity as well. The M600 has a, a, a higher payload capacity. Troy, you've got a question about the FLIR software on a Mac. I believe um, they don't currently have a solution for the Mac to run the Clear Tool software. However, uh, with uh, with Mac and Apple, I believe you can run uh, a, something like Parallels or, or or sort of a dual boot where you can run a Windows uh, setup to run the Clear Tools. That's a great question. I have a great question from Rosa. Um, her question is, when using a thermal sensor, how deep could it read a heat signature uh, if you're reading water leakage in the ground? 
there's a lot of variables to that. Uh, obviously, the uh, the image earlier where you were able to see the hot water um, buried pipeline, that is that is an extreme uh, temperature delta. So you're able to see that. So it really depends on uh, what that temperature difference is, and um, you know if, if we're talking about um, standing water, if we're talking about uh, cold water from a uh, from from pipeline. So it really depends on what those uh, what that scenario is. Definitely send me an email on that, and we can we can discuss that further. All right. Tom, uh, you've got a question. You've got an Inspire One with XT, and uh, you're you're looking at setting up, performing uh, building window inspections to detect water leaks around the windows. That is an excellent question. Um, like I said, I think some of the there's a lot of variables that will go into that, and um, you know, as I would definitely recommend seeking training to become a thermographer, certified thermographer. Um, this is going to be you're definitely going to have a lot of variables like emissivity that you have to look into and, and make sure and, and have those accounted for. Um, send me an email on that as well, and I, I can, we can definitely discuss that further in further detail. Some more questions coming in. Hey Rick, thanks for that question. Uh, we have a question of uh, will the range be affected with multiple video feeds, i.e. Uh, feed versus the FPV feed? Um, uh, the feeds coming from the DJI uh, is, is a digital feed and obviously your range is going to be uh, what DJI specs out um, typically between the, depending on the platform five to seven kilometers. Now with an FPV uh, feed, that's you're talking about an analog feed typically. Uh, which are not as great as a digital feed. So you, you are going to have uh, some differences there. Uh, got a question about uh, heat being seen through water. Um, that's that is a, a very good question. Um, typically, uh, you saw on the um, the earlier slide where you could see the dispersion of the water. Um, however, you know you're you're going to be looking at the the surface temperatures, uh, not necessarily not necessarily being able to penetrate that. Great question from Joe. Uh, regarding uh, uh, from a residential roofing perspective, 
Do you envision it being easier to make a case for insurance roof replacement uh, that you would not normally get from a human eye inspection? It's a very good question. I, I definitely think that uh, you can you can make a pretty good case. Uh, obviously, uh, a thermal image of a flat roof, you're going to be able to see damage, uh, water damage, uh, or, or penetration to the barriers um, through the thermal image that you simply will not see via 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 the, the naked eye. So that's a very good question. Mark, uh, great question. Uh, any experience using the DJI goggles with the XT? Currently, uh, we have not. Um, but uh, obviously, if you if you're running a a, a secondary, uh, a, you know, two pilot type setup where uh, you've got a, a gimbal operator operating that, uh, that definitely would would help. I would say because you're able to cut out all the glare from the sun. But uh, right at this moment, no direct experience, but uh, we'll definitely get that tested and let you know. Wait a few minutes and uh, see if we've got any additional questions. Again, like I said, uh, after this uh, webinar, I will be summarizing all of the questions and uh, questions that um, that require a little bit more discussion, I'll definitely get, get back to you on that and, and get some answers for you. All right. That will conclude, that will conclude today's, oh, looks like we got one more question. Uh, so the question uh, from, um, from MacBook uh, looks like uh, essentially the, I, the question about detecting heat uh, underwater, and I believe that I believe for that particular uh, scenario, uh, thermal may not be is definitely not the right sensor for that, um, uh, simply because you're not going to be able to see uh, at depth. Um, uh, the heat signatures. Excellent. Just a few more minutes to uh, got some other questions coming in. Uh, another great question regarding uh, lead times. Um, typically, there uh, there there is a lead time. However, uh, I'd say typically there's a lead time of about three to four weeks uh, when ordering a thermal camera. However, we do keep many of the uh, configurations in stock. So, uh, when ordering from us, you're you're essentially not going to have that uh, that long lead time. Oh, I got another great question. Uh, question was: Does the Zenmuse Zen XT work with the Osmo? Um, the, the the answer is is no. Uh, Mir has a, a number of handheld thermal uh, options for that, and currently I don't think there are any plans to uh, to make the uh, Zenmuse XT compatible with the Osmo at this time.
another great question uh, coming from uh, Jared. Can the FLIR uh, image, uh, can the FLIR see through treetops uh, in, in day or night? That's a great question. Obviously, uh, the thermal camera is best used uh, in either late evening or at, uh, at night. Uh, we do have a lot of uh, pretty good samples of, um, of the thermal cameras being used being used in, in a nighttime scenario and also in uh, high vegetation. I can certainly uh, get some of those examples over. Another great question. Um, at what altitude uh, does thermal imaging become impractical to identify a human-sized uh, object? Um, typically, uh, obviously, your, your, your max is uh, 400 AGL, according to um, the FAA. Uh, that's, that's definitely a bit excessive. Uh, I would say that your, your best height is probably going to be around the 100 to, let's say, about a 150 uh, feet range. Also, we work directly with FLIR, so if there are uh, obviously any scenarios or any projects that require some extensive, um, uh, I would say, extensive questions, we can definitely get your uh, get those questions answered and, and, and identify a, a solution for your project. I had a question about the, uh, again, uh, the FLIR on the uh, Inspire 2. Um, currently, just like the, uh, I believe I did answer this uh, earlier, but uh, the Inspire 2 is a, is a, has been designated as a commercial uh, cinema platform, and uh, currently there aren't any plans to integrate the XT. However, uh, definitely give us a call. We, we can uh, work out some other solutions for you. A great question from Ricky. For power line inspection, uh, is the first camera in danger of radiant power from uh, power lines? Um, there is typically a, a standoff distance that's required uh, when operating in that particular use case. Uh, I would believe about uh, 40, I believe about 40 feet. Um, and at that range, uh, you, you know, you're not going to see any of those effects. Obviously, in, in that particular use case, uh, you may want to go with a 19 millimeter. Um, again, uh, you're going to have a lot of detail once you find your hot spot, but uh, you may have to fly a little bit uh, farther in order to get that wider field of view to, uh, to initially spot those hot spots. Um, I believe that at a standoff distance of about 40, 40 feet, uh, you would not see any effect of, uh, you know, I'd say like the corona discharge or anything like that, or EMF interference. Another good uh, use case for that, uh, for that particular setup, is is running a, a DRTK system, which eliminates the re, uh, the dependency on the uh, typical uh, compass and uh, you know interference from uh, from that EMF signal. No problem. Thank you. Uh, I got a lot of thanks. Thanks. Uh, hope, I hope you did learn a lot. And again, uh, I will be sending out a summary of all the questions uh, at the end. And uh, questions that uh, that I didn't get answered uh, right then and here, like I said, we can work with Clear and get you some answers. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.
I that uh, that concludes uh, today's webinar. And like I said, watch out for that email. I'll be sending out those uh, summary summary uh, questions.